Welcome to the Silver City Planning and Zoning Commission for Tuesday, April 1st, 2014. Um, if everyone would please stand and we'll do the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, and could we have roll call, Ms. Imbe? Commissioner Clements? Here. Commissioner Stevens? Here. Commissioner Furby? Commissioner Seibel? Here. All right, and next on is the approval of the agenda. I move to approve the agenda as it stands. So Second. Good to me. Oh, except for, could you make a, uh, a move to switch the approval of the minutes to next month, since we don't okay. have enough to vote? Uh, do we have a second? Second. Okay. All in favor of switching uh, March 4th approval of those minutes to next month's agenda, aye? Aye. 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 Good. Okay. Uh, we do not have any old business. We have no public hearings this evening, no new business. Um, so in a few minutes here, we will have the community forum, which is going to be the code enforcement presentation by the Town of Silver City's Code Enforcement uh, Division. Do you have any reports from commission tonight? Not a report, but a question. Jamie, were you able to find out, do we need to have a vice chair? You don't have to. Okay, thank you. Any other reports? I guess I'd like to say welcome back to Commissioner Sam. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. So, Good to have you back, and do you have any reports? <laughs> do you have anything you want to go over? I do not, other than that I'm pleased to be back with you on the Planning and Zoning Commission. I've already been told by uh, Jamie that I don't get another plaque when I quit next time, so I have to keep the one that she gave me last year. So I guess uh, any, anything I can do to uh, help the town's bottom line, right? Okay. And I assume we have no community input, so all we have left on the agenda, and we have a few minutes to wait, but all we have left then is the presentation. Okay. That's perfect. <laughs> Hello, good evening. I'm here to introduce what code enforcement does. I'm part of the code enforcement division. My name is Jacqueline McNeese. I have been doing this for almost two years. On April 11th, I'll be up. That'll be the anniversary of two years. So I'm still pretty new, but okay. So basically, code enforcement, it consists of two major components. The first one would be enforcement functions and basically that's to receive, investigate, regulate, enforce, or refer to the proper jurisdictional agency. All citizens complaints and a lot of the complaints we get are anonymous complaints so we go out and investigate that anytime someone calls in. We document it, take photos, and then investigate further. And those are all the violations that are in the town ordinance and the town ordinance I'm sure you've seen it. it's a pretty thick book so we go through a lot of those. The enforcement process is conducted by the methods of routine patrol observations, which there's me, I go around in my vehicle, it's a town vehicle, and the same with my supervisor, she has her own vehicle, so we go around and to say there's a the non complaint or someone complains, we'll go around, we'll check up on certain cases to see if people complied, just different things like that, make sure everyone's in compliance, and most people for the most part are pretty compliant, so. Other things we do, is we also observe public nuisances. When we do this, to notify people, we either do, we mostly do door hangers. And it says notice to correct. And that gives people a certain amount of days and we let them know. It's not basically if you're not getting cited or in trouble. It's just letting you know. You received an anonymous complaint, that's something I would write. For you to cut your reeds or put away an optimal vehicle. And so they get a certain amount of time to remedy that. 
And if they don't do that, then usually the next step is going to uh, into a citation. And that gives them a little more time before citations. But we don't really, so far people have been good, so I haven't had to do that much citations. But that's kind of like the last step we do. So we kind of have three steps, door hanger, the letter, and then the citation process. Our goal is to achieve voluntary compliance. And I'll let people know, we'll let people know of this. Because a lot of people get really intimidated. They see us and think, oh, we're being cited in the court. They say, no, our looking is for voluntary compliance. As long as I see progress by the compliance state, then it's good. Then people understand. Besides that, our final step of enforcement for non-compliance, as I mentioned before, is the citation, and that's municipal court. Sometimes, under crucial circumstances, the town may have to intervene regarding private properties to resolve a violation at the town manager's approval. This action has been proven to be very costly to the town at times, which mandates a lien being placed against the property to recover costs. Sometimes this happens, it's not very often for, for example, say someone abandons a property and you have a building that's left deteriorating. You can contact the people all you want, they won't listen, so the next step would be, okay, we're gonna have to put a lien on this property. So that's what that last step is. And it does, like I said, uh, lean against the property. It is costly to the town, but so far we haven't had to do that very often, so it's been pretty good. Okay, our second component, is the administrative functions. We receive and process all new business registrations and licenses. And the most common one are the business registrations. Whether someone's coming in doing you know, landscaping or they want to open up a gallery, it just depends. So that's a really common one. We also issue peddler permits, special event permits, such as the tour of the Hilo or the Blues Fest, that's where the special event is. We have transient merchants, and that's usually people that come in maybe for the weekends and you might see them on the corner of High 180 and Swan, like selling furniture and whatnot. And also transient site permits. In addition, we issue CRS tax numbers since the CRS numbers are required to register for a business. So we do that for people. And that's on the behalf of the state's tax and revenue office. And we send that to the tax office in Cruces. The Code Enforcement Division also researches, gathers evidence, and prosecutes most of our own municipal courtroom cases. We also review plans, special events, or matters that involve code enforcement processing that are presented before town council, planning and zoning, and all other town departments as necessary. Our most common violations or safety issues addressed are water meter tampering, trespassing into meter cans, Theft of water, unlawful water connections, sewer backup, unlawful sewer connections, prohibited discharge leaving property, which that could be anything like water or gray water, and sometimes that's sewer coming off the property going onto the sidewalk or the street. We investigate and refer septic issues to the state environmental office since septic is considered state. So many times we come across that. We'll still investigate and take photos and document it, but we'll also let the environmental department know because they're the ones that take care of it afterwards. We do grease traps that are required. And grease traps have, that's usually restaurants to say the sewer gets clogged up and they find out who's coming from, so we have to send out a notice to them, let them know they got to remedy that and get the grease trap fixed. There's notification over C termination of town utility systems. That's kind of like a last resort. For instance, if they don't get something, the sewer fixed during the time that we give them, then it may be shut off, but that normally doesn't really happen. There's also unlawful cuts into town curbs, sidewalks, and streets. People can't just cut into a sidewalk or make their own driveway or they'll block it or they want to add something, so they have to get permits for that. There's dilapidated or missing street signs, which can be issued, say signs missing or falls down. We have to notify streets to take care of that. Obstructions in the town right-of-ways. It could be anything, once again, someone building a driveway or they might have a car park coming out or maybe a bush blocking us. You gotta make sure that the sidewalks are clear. You can't have anything on the sidewalk. Another is overfilled solid waste in town receptacles and dumpsters. And that's Sometimes people will do that, like the sanitation department will notify us and we'll go and people have the trash coming out, so we also leave a notice and usually that's remedied. 
There's illegal dumping of waste or other materials around town receptacles. And usually if we find evidence, because nice people will leave evidence to your name in the mail, then we can send out a letter to them to let them know you can't do that again. There's unauthorized grading or large placement of fill piles. There's drainage and floodway blockage. And our most common one is the abatement of weeds, debris, rubbish, and junk cars on private property. And that's what we come across the most, especially during the summer. And even now, you may notice the weeds will start growing, and that can pose a fire hazard. Same with trash. You don't want to, a lot of people don't want to see their neighbors junk everywhere. And the same with an operable vehicle. So they should be, they shouldn't be viewed from the streets or any surrounding areas. So what I usually do is have them cover up the car or put it in the garage or behind a fence. Basically, that's out of view. So those are the ones that are the most common. We make referrals regarding fire hazards and fire assessments in the fire department. Illegal dumping anywhere within the town limits, people can't do that. Investigate of homeless camps. Damage to town properties. We also do teardowns and abatement of dangerous buildings. Graffiti and other miscellaneous public nuisances. And also another one that comes up quite often is operating a business without a business registration, license, or vendor permit. And usually someone will call and ask, well, is this business, are they licensed, are they registered, and make sure. And if they're not, we'll just let them know. If it's come in, fill out a business registration, and then they'll be complied. We also make referrals for vector issues. There's business proprietors not following proper town guidelines to conduct business. For instance, say someone's adding on an addition to their building. They can't do that without a permit, so they have to come to us first before they can do that. We enforce land use code violations such as RVs being utilized as a residence dwellings outside of commercial RV parks. So basically people can't use an RV as a dwelling and have connections and use that as a home. They have to be in an RV park. No appropriate manufactured home screening. People have to have the screening around the manufactured homes. Encroachment issues into the town right away. No sign permits for businesses. And people have to come in for a permit before they put up a sign. If there's an existing sign that was there, if it's the same size, that's okay. But if they want to make it bigger or add extras, they have to come in and get a sign permit before they can proceed. There's lighting issues. Complaint and safety issues referring to the building inspector and the fire marshal. There will be people that call us and I'm concerned about this building or that. So, like I said, once again, we'll look at it, but we'll also refer it to the proper department. And we'll also enforce the compliance on land use guidelines and standards on various issues. And last of all, interface and work in conjunction with all other agencies and town departments needing co enforcement assistance or services or vice versa. So, do you have any questions? Well, first, thank you very much for the presentation. Thank you. Um, you did guys do a lot more than I realized. <laughs> first, my first question, is your range just Silver City, or do you go a little bit into that uh, external outside of town, or is, are you only in Silver City limits? Mostly in the Silver City limits. The only time we kind of go out of town, what is it, about two, three miles out of town? We have to monitor and make sure that we're not issues come up, the violence come up, and then get involved outside of the city limits. Okay. Any, anything outside of that that goes through the county code enforcement officer. Okay. Um, another one of my questions um, when you, like, say somebody complains about somebody, maybe fire damage or hazard and you go out to the house and it could be someone who only lives here part of the year what attempts do you make to contact the people I mean, are you able to find their other residents and send them a letter or what attempts do you make to contact people who might be on vacation for extended time or that sort of thing well, that does come up sometimes the first step is the door hanger and after all check and if I notice there's no one there or the door hanger is still hanging out the door I find out who the owner is we'll look it up through the Grant County website, or I could ask the mapper, and we find out the information, and I'll send out a letter. And usually, I haven't really had a problem. There's been a few cases where you can't find the owner because pretty much the place is just abandoned. But that's the, what I do is send out letters. And usually, people will get them. Oh, I was out of town. I'm sorry. And okay, just as long as they have voluntary compliance, I'm happy. And for the most part, they'll get it cleaned up. 
Well, just a question, kind of tag on to that, and I don't know how often it happens, but if the property is in the process of being foreclosed, but has not been foreclosed upon, it's not owned by the bank, still owned by the person that took out the mortgage, uh, do we have to go in and clean and secure, or do the banks normally come and assist you with that? Most of, most of the time, until the actual sale has been closed upon, it's still that property owner's responsibility. It is very difficult to get banks to help us if a house is in limbo and there has been a foreclosure. We have to track down the bank, the mortgage companies, talk to their code enforcement divisions because most of them have their own secure properties division and we work with them. It may take longer for us to get you know complete resolution to the case but we always hold the property owners responsible up until when the bank takes it over then we work directly with the bank okay. thank you and with all the things you do i'm just curious how many people are in your division how many there's julie right there she's the lead court enforcement officer and there's me just two of you yes oh my word okay do you have any other questions? Um, I'm, I'm a little curious. It sounds like you don't actually cite people into municipal court that often. I mean, it, it sounds like it's a goal to not do that when you can. It just depends on the situation. Each so, case is different from each other. Do you have some idea, percentage-wise, of the, the number of people that you have some contact with that it progresses to where you actually cite them into court? We'll be bringing that up in a minute. Oh, okay, perfect. <laughs> <laughs> um, we also talked about how the uh, municipal court deals with it. I, I've just always been curious about that. Okay, excellent. You mentioned CRS numbers. Yes. Could you give like a, uh, I don't know if there's a good definition of who needs to get one? In other words, if a person who's starting a business being a dog walker, do they need a CRS number? Is it a person who's just painting houses and that's all they do is that their yard work, do they need a CRS number? Could you, is there a definition of who actually legally needs to get a CRS number? Anybody who conducts business in town needs a CRS number. It's required on the form because we send our business registrations to utility billing and city hall. They will not accept a business or finalize unless there's a tax ID number. So even people who are cleaning houses, any, anybody who's just taking in money for any job, period? Yes. For it to be a legitimate business, they need that number. And there's also a lot of people that are from the county to come in and they get that number because they're not going to have to drive all the way to Cruces because that's the nearest tax office. And can they do that online or does it have to be through the office? They can do it online, but it's usually quicker if they come through us because usually if you do it online, you have to wait. But if they come to the office, we issue out the number right then and there, and then they can put it on the business registration. So it's pretty quick, and it doesn't cost anything. And they just, if they wanted to do it online, they would just go to that taxation or revenue site. Yeah, I imagine they would. Okay. Is there anything else? Yeah, one more. Is the standard pretty much the same, or the process pretty much the same if it's a residential building or a commercial building or or vacant land what that has a lot of weeds? No, not businesses, but enforcement. Yeah, it depends. There's, a, there's the land use code section which says what people can have and what not they can't have, depending on which zoning they're in. But it's pretty much all the same for certain things, such as weeds or in our whole vehicles and trash and other things like that are considered public nuisances. They're all the same in all the zones. And I'm kind of asking this to tie into something that passed a while ago through the town council, but I believe it's being reinvestigated again. And that was the vacancy ordinance for the downtown district. Yeah, that's being re-looked at. There's some issues about um, the uh, comprehensiveness of it and um, some of the terms of it, and so um, it's being re-examined. Uh, Peter, how long does that sort of re-looking take? Um, I think it's uh, before the mayor for his consideration. Anything else? Thank you, it was uh, McNeese, right? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening.
evening. I'm Julie Salais. I'm the lead code enforcement officer for the town of Silver City, and I'm entering my seventh year working for the town. I also have over 25 years of law enforcement experience throughout my life. Uh, so I bring um, some good skills to this position. Uh, we're very successful in researching a lot of our cases. Um, to previously address your question, Mr. Seibel, we get about 85% voluntary compliance and maybe 15% we have to cite into court. And I was going to bring uh, the 2013 statistics for you, which Peter can pass out to you. Um, for the statistics, we had a total for the year of 2013, 971 cases that myself and Jacqueline worked. We were successful in closing, like I said, a majority of them with voluntary compliance. And then we had seven uh, excuse me, 17 citations that were brought into municipal court out of all of those 971 cases. So I think that's just a really very good uh, outcoming of how we work with the public. Our main tools are education, listening, understanding, and basically uh, all of our cases have different little components to them, whether somebody is sick and they can't take care of their place, or somebody who can't care for themselves, we might have to make a referral to Adult Protective Services. We might have to do a little more than just code enforcement. We like to try to help give the best wraparound service we can for our citizens. Uh, I think our approach has been most successful because we use those tools to work with the public and it's proven to be successful at least the time I've been here. Um, there's of course always a small population that doesn't want us on their doorsteps or don't want to see us around the neighborhood, but we have to do our job for the safe betterment of the community so everybody can prosper. Um, in your statistics that you were passed out, it's all been pretty much broken down with the cases that we've had. A big majority of them, I would say, probably 93% are all complaint-based. Uh, we have sometimes very little time to initiate things on our own because we are responding to either complaints where we do have people that are willing to come forward and give us their names and another large percentage that want to remain anonymous. So every case we have to investigate, take our photos and gather our evidence and start off with like Jacqueline said the door hanger process and then from there if there's non-compliance we will then search out the property owner. We'll go with the letter of Lewis citation and give them another 10 days or more to respond. Then if that doesn't work, then the final step is citation process. Now in the citation process, depending upon how many violations you're gonna list on the citations is what's gonna make an impact on your fines. For instance, Fines can go up to $500 and or 90 days in jail. And that's for every violation. And some of our citations can have anywhere as to four to five violations on one ticket. So that can kind of give you a general ballpark at what you're looking at if the judge should find you guilty. Or if there's a plea of no contest, she may give them court fines and fees, but may have them reduced. Or she may even give them probationary time to still bring that property into compliance. And she may also lower the fees. So it is basically up to Judge Sonia Ruiz to make that call. Um, we also take a lot of time in our court case preparations We've been very successful in our prosecuting of our own cases. I think maybe one or two times we've had to contact the town lawyer uh, 
we've been able to handle most of our cases on our own by just our procedures and how we handle things. Um, we don't have a lot of people willing to come testify, which I understand, but the few we do have, those cases seem to have relatively proven their point and the people have gotten fines for those violations. Um, you can stop me anytime if you have any questions. <laughs> I do have a question. Sure. You mentioned something I've just absolutely never thought about, and that is you get an anonymous call, you go to the house, and you find out that there's someone who's really not able to get out. They're shut in, or there's, let's say, what looks like activity going on that is um, not very healthy, whether it be to animals, children, elderly, etc. Do you work then with other agencies to try and refer follow up outside of the code enforcement? Oh yes, by no means we are not working in the scope of a social worker. Oh, I know. But we will refer cases. There's times where we've had to call the police department. There's times where we've had to talk to the detectives about other cases going on or what we suspect may be happening. Adult Protective Services. Uh, we've contacted uh, Behavior Health Services. We've even had caseworkers come out on some of the homeless cases we've had to work and get involved in. We just really try to help the community. We aren't just about enforcement. We're about making and building a better community. Thank you. Um, there are some codes that you obviously don't, that you must refer it directly to the police or maybe they just don't even call you, like the noise ordinance the or dogs barking, things like that. Those are in the codes, but you don't handle those. Is that correct? Um, we, it depends. Um, if there's a situation where it's obvious there's some, some construction, let's say, going on during the day and it is just way too loud, we might go by and tell them, you know, you guys need to turn down your radios or whatever. But we never do the police officer's job. We will not go to loud parties and break that up. We will not make traffic stops. We aren't the police. So there's several noise ordinance violations that only the police can enforce because we are not uh, sworn police officers. We don't carry sidearms. We just communicate. If we feel the situation safe, we might say, well, you know, we'll go tell them to keep the dog quiet or something, or we'll call Officer Sherwood, who handles all the animal calls. So we always find a solution somehow and protect ourselves at the same time. Okay, I'll, I'll continue a little bit further. Um, for 2013, I'd like to give the total amount of the registration activity. So for the year of 2013, we had 112 business registrations issued. We had five business licenses issued. We had 13 special event permits issued. We had 12 peddler permits issued. We had four transient site permits issued and eight transient merchant permits issued. Now the site permits is when the property owner registers their property to allow vendors to come on to their property and sell from their property. So we call those authorized lots. We just don't allow anybody to set up on any street corner in town and to start conducting business. It has to be on an authorized lot. Now, also in your um, handout that Peter gave you, there's a comparison chart, so you might want to take a look at that. Um, you can see that there's been a substantial increase in code enforcement cases. Uh, business registrations went up a little bit. We did have a decrease in business licenses, special events, peddler permits, transient site permits, and transient merchant permits. So any questions you may have, um, we welcome you always to stop by or feel free to contact us. 
Um, Jamie used to be a former code officer <laughs> before she went into the planning, so she also is very knowledgeable in case we're out on the field and you just happen to stop by. Jamie's pretty good with that. And Peter, of course, he's been a, a blessing in my book to help direct us a lot because uh, we kind of think alike. We always try to do things for the betterment of the community. And uh, Alex has been very supportive. And so has Mr. Scavron. He's been so beneficial when we go to him for advice, legal advice, in cases like what Jacqueline talked about. If we're dealing with an abandoned property, maybe the property owner was deceased and there's been no will no probate action, so then we have to come talk to the probate judge. There's a lot of research in cleaning up properties, let me tell you. For, so for two women for the town of Silver, I think we've done pretty well. I've got to say I'm amazed at the number of cases that you handle for just two people. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you for everything you do. I just want to mention a couple of things. That's all right. Um, in terms of business registration, um, there's about a thousand business active business registrations right now in town, in a town of ten thousand. So that's quite a lot of activity. And when they do these registrations, it's not just taking names and numbers. It's making sure that the business is going into an area that's suitably zoned for that kind of business. It's making sure that the farm marshal has inspected it, if there's uh, people that are going to be going to the site. It's uh, making sure that um, the, the, the police uh, have looked into the traffic circulation or that the planning has looked into there's enough parking spaces for what's proposed. So there's quite a bit of research that goes on into making sure that the business registrations, uh, the businesses are complying with the town standards. At the same time, I think that the uh, code department really works hard to facilitate people's understanding of the process. It is often confusing to a number of them. They come in and they're not sure what the CRS number is, and the town provides that as a service. I mean, that's really a state um, requirement but uh, we do have it on our forms. Um, they might have uh, some questions about, well, how do I get a hold of the farm marshal? And so there's a lot of helping on that. And right now they're working on a kind of a, a, a guideline that they can hand out to people that's streamlined so that people can understand what steps are involved and who they need to talk to. But the purpose is to not only ensure that the businesses are compliant, but to help them be successful, to help them get through the process. The other thing that I want to emphasize is, um, and both of uh, the officers have touched on it, basically they enforce everything in this book that is not otherwise enforced by the police department. And, you know, when there is a, a, a say, a, a sewer backup, the sewer, the, 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 the utilities department send them to talk to you about it and what to do. Or if there is, a, you know, garbage, uh, you know, that's not being disposed of correctly, the sanitation department will send them to talk to you about it. And they've talked, uh, they've addressed, you know, their strategy of seeking voluntary compliance primarily educating people, gee, this is a problem. They've also talked about identifying people that sometimes just aren't able to do this on their own for a variety of reasons, and so they're trying to find solutions for that. If there's, um, you know, somebody that's uh, pulling out a sidewalk, the Public Works Department will send them to talk to you about it. So there's a lot of um, responsibility that's shared between all the departments that comes down to them. Um, and at the same time, they uh, uh, duly uh, stressed that, you know, if they need to involve state agencies, whether it's adult protective services or, you know, youth and children, you know, issues, they'll go to those agencies and they'll make those contacts. They work with the county and the county code enforcement officers. They work with the police department. 
if there is a land use code, we send them a, a code issue, we send them to talk to you about it. So they have a lot of responsibility. It's a very difficult job to confront people that have some kind of problem and persuade them to resolve the issue. It's, it's really a challenge. And so I think there are very special people that can do this, and, and, and a lot can't, um, because there's so many triggers for, you know, some kind of confrontation or some kind of, you know, you, uh, uh, aggression, and you just need very strong skills to be able to um, help move people towards a solution that's uh, beneficial and voluntary. So I have enormous admiration for what they do and it's quite complex. It's not just, you know, finding stuff that's wrong. It's really working to solve it. Thank you for saying that. Yeah, I could tell by the presentation they did a lot more than I was aware of. So a lot more. And I, I you know, have to say that um, there are things that there, there's, there's, there's more on their plate than just the two can resolve. And so the prior, there's some priorities that are set, and the priorities are really uh, safety issues, you know, health issues, complaint-based. They're not able to get to every single thing, so they prioritize those issues. And, you know, on the complaints, it's kind of tricky because Sometimes people would like to use um, the city as a means of um, fighting with their neighbor or some kind of resort. And so they have to be able to recognize the situations and what's really going on here. And uh, that can be tricky too. The purpose is to be fair, meaning treating all alike, and I think that goes to your question about the businesses and the homeowners. I mean, the effort is to address the problems that they are confronted with in a manner that lets the people understand what the issue is and how it might be solved and to see if they might need some help doing it. Um, and, you know, in some of the teardowns or some of the large um, uh, you know, there's some hoarding issues sometimes. People just have all kinds of stuff that they really don't know what to do with. And at that point, they can't really afford to take it to the dump. They, and so the code will work with Alex to see if there's some long-term, you know, payback program that can help people deal with that. Or sometimes the person they're dealing with is an heir to the property and had no idea that, oh my gosh, this is terrible. Can you give us some time to work with it? We want to fix it. Um, so it's, it's really involves a lot of psychology. It involves a lot of facilitation. And I think that Julie really said it well. The purpose is to build a better community. That's, that's what we're trying to do, you know, working together. Uh, it's not to find wrongdoing and to assign blame. It's to help people build a better place together. Uh, I kind of was wondering if when the housing market had a downturn, you had to have had your business go up <laughs> quite a bit, I'm assuming. Yeah. We had an increase in the things that homes that were just left. And it it was kind of disheartening. Some of them were beautiful homes. You know, um, you can see a lot of people put a lot of work and love and care and redoing them. And then they lost them, whether due to employment loss or death. So uh, we try to work on those homes right away because the longer a home stays vacant, the work gets around. And before you know it, a window gets broken, a door gets kicked in, you know, or we'll get referrals from the police department saying, hey, can you guys do something with this house? 
It's been vacant for a while, we heard. The owner passed away. So we really try to get on top of those cases because we don't want to see it burnt down. We know maybe a, possibly another family can move into there. So we try to put those kind of up on a higher priority list because it can just lead to all kinds of problems to leave property vacated like that for periods of time. And one note I'd like to make to the general public is uh, I've seen when I'm out taking walks where people have obviously just taken a truckload of their things and just dumped it somewhere. And I, maybe people are unaware that it, you have to put quite a bit into the landfill each month before they charge you. So if they're willing to drive a mile out of town to dump their stuff, they might as well take it to landfill because I think people are afraid of being charged. But, you know, you have a, a, a weight limit per month, and you have to take quite a bit of stuff to hit that limit. And it would be really nice if people were aware that they could just do that. Right. I'm glad you brought that up, Commissioner, because, um, and if this is being televised, we do, in certain cases, go through the trash. We will look to see what we can find to help identify who the person was that dumped. And we will take action against that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other questions? Great. This has been a wonderful presentation. A lot of information, a lot of new information. I, that's fantastic. You guys were willing to take your time and come tonight, and you did a fantastic job. And I want to thank Mr. Russell for your added comments, too. Those were valuable. Great job. Yes, <laughs> so, absolutely. So, okay. And I think we've already done everything else on the agenda. We move to adjourn. I second it. All in favor of adjournment? Aye. 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 Thank you, thank you.